Mountains, A Road Less Paved takes us on an extraordinary journey from her home in Occidental all the way to Tierra del Fuego, the southernmost tip of South America. Another subsequent road trip, road trip took them to Costa Rica, Honduras, Guatemala, Belize, and Mexico. Mary remembers all of these places and people with great depth and humor, confirming what those who know her already know. She has always been a gypsy in her heart. As we begin the evening, you all will be muted so that, you'll, you, so that you don't accidentally appear on the full screen by making a noise. Mary will be joined by her two grown children, Gino and Fawn, who were just kids when they traveled with their parents. They each will read selections from the book. Following this, Barbara Bear, also longtime OCA friend, supporter, and volunteer, will have an informal chat with Mary. Among wonderful novels Barbara has launched at OCA, she's also been a travel writer for many years. Her travel tales have appeared in Tra Traveler's Tales, Persimmon Tree, Massachusetts Review, Narrative Magazine, among others. She says she's always been inspired to write both fiction and nonfiction after travels, sometimes years later in unexpected ways, the unexpected gifts of traveling. Mary and Barbara will have an informal conversation about Mary's adventures. If we have time, we'll then open the room to questions. There are two ways that you can do this. First, you can click on the participants icon below your screen. A box will appear. Go to the bottom right and click on raise your hand. That will put you on a list that Tina, wearing her Zoom host hat, will use to call on you and you'll then be unmuted. The second option is to enter the chat room. Click on that icon at the bottom of your screen. You can type in your question or comment and Tina can read that to Mary for her answer. We aim for an hour, but if it goes over just a bit, we hope that's, uh, I hope you all can stay. And the other thing, this evening is being recorded and will be available on YouTube for those of you, who, those who couldn't make it tonight or for those who might just wanna see it again. The book is $15 and can be purchased via the website, our website, or by the email that Tina will send all registrant, registrants following our event tonight. You can pay via PayPal and you don't need to be a PayPal member um, or any other credit card. Or, and you should know, Mary is generously donating 100% of all book sale proceeds to OCA. Mary, you are awesome. We bow to you, thank you so much. Also, besides purchasing the book, if you're inclined to add a donation to OCA, we would be forever grateful. So it's now my pleasure to give you Mary, Gino, and Fawn, and in a little bit later, Barbara. Thank you, Suze. It's really wonderful to be here. You've already mentioned the uh, support that we all had for the Art Center before it even existed. And uh, I kind of felt like if you wanted to be friends with Doris Murphy, our kit newsletter, it was a requirement, <laughs> but one that was well worth it. And uh, it's wonderful when a dream is realized and hopefully we're keeping that dream alive through these hard times. So now I'll, I'll get to my reading. It's uh, the first chapter of the book, and it's not the entire first chapter. So I'll read some, then Gina will come in, and then Fawn will come in, and we'll all be in that first chapter but it still won't be the entire first chapter. And the, and the film that you might or might not see uh, behind us, and then later there may be some, uh, it's all places that you might see and be able to enjoy as a part of the book. You know, so it doesn't take you anywhere that the book doesn't take you. Um, so, here we go. Almost to Cabo. 
which is in Baja, California, but starts here in our own sweet home of Occidental. A lonely woman with too much time on her hands. That's me after we move to the end of a dead end road in a rural area where we don't know a soul. There isn't much chance I'll soon have friends in the neighborhood. There is no neighborhood. The two houses closest to us are usually unoccupied because they're vacation rentals. Our cottages. Jean, my husband, leaves early on weekdays in our only car. He has a long commute to work and doesn't return until 6 p.m. A little later after he leaves, our children, Rich and Vaughn, leave for their long walk to catch the school bus. They have to walk even if it's raining and it rains a lot. When they reach the series of potholes and bumps in the road that's called a paved road, there's no safe sidewalk or even a shoulder. The way's narrow, part of it's steep, with a blind curve. I picture them wiping blood rather than water from their little faces. I worry, I feel guilty. I know they'll tell their children this story someday. Their children will think, that's the way it was in the olden days. But this isn't the olden days. This is 1974 in Sonoma County, California, USA. We aren't pioneers. I'm by myself in the Redwoods because we don't have a second car or a first friend and there's no public transportation. If I had a car, I could take the children to work or school. Yeah, I could get a job. Then I wouldn't have too much time on my hands. I wouldn't be lonely. There are people who feel isolated in the midst of friends or family. That's not me. I'm lonely when I'm alone but relatives and friends are far away. Jean and the children aren't so distant, but they're gone most of my waking hours. Cleaning our tiny home doesn't take long. It's a 10 by 45 foot trailer. One way I entertain myself is planning a driving trip from our Northern California location all the way down the mid the Mexican Peninsula of Baja, California, to Land's End at Cabo San Lucas. We've made two short camping trips to the upper end, and they just whetted my appetite for more. I read, study maps, make mileage and time calculations. I take this factual material into my daydreams I picture our camp set up under a small grove of palm trees on a cerulean lagoon. Islands float on the still surface. The sun shines, the water's warm. This isn't a fantasy beach. It's Bahia de Concepcion. We can get there in our regular passenger car without traveling too far from the main highway. The paved road was only completed a year ago in 1973. I want to go before the wildlife learns to stay away. Before the fast food, motels, and mobletudry arrive. But years pass. We build a house and have another baby. When the baby Gino is two and a half, Rich 16, and Fawn 14, we finally make the Baja Drive. When we're almost to Cabo, 
we make a detour to a friend's family place in the private enclave of Las Baracas. A hand-drawn map shows that shortly after we cross an arroyo, we turn off the main road onto dirt and gravel. The map is good. We find Las Baracas. Our friend's house, which we have to ourselves, is as close to the ocean as it can get without falling in. There are no other tourists, no commercial facilities. Luckily, we have provisions. Unlike, unluckily, the plastic tube with a picture of a pig on it turns out to be pork lard rather than pork sausage. Jean, Rich, and Fawn paddle out in a small boat and dive for oysters. I dip the shucked oysters in seasoned cornmeal, fry them, and serve them with wedges of juicy little limes. They're the best oysters we've ever had. We don't miss the sausage. We decide to skip going to Cabo so we can stay a little longer in our hidden paradise. It's raining when we leave, but we don't have any trouble on the dirt and gravel roads. Rich and Fawn cheer when we reach the main highway because on the smoother surface, they can read and sleep. Jean and I are happy too, because we've put the potential problems of a muddy road safely behind us. Soon, we come to where the highway crosses the arroyo. The road is flooded. This shouldn't come as such a surprise since arroyo is Spanish for creek, but it was perfectly dry when we came this way a few days earlier. Now, a long line of vehicles back up on either side of the water. I wonder how long it'll take for this to drain, I ask aloud. Longer than we have, says Jean. This is what can happen when a road follows the lay of the land rather than being engineered. We have a thousand miles of lay of the land before we cross the border to perfectly engineered freeways. I wonder, how many flooded arroyos await us along those miles? How many bridges washed out? How many detours? People are out of their cars, smoking record cigarettes, talking, watching the water not recede. A ballsy truck driver on the other side pulls out of the line of parked vehicles and drives right into the mess. He makes it across. Gene says, if we try that, the floors and part of the seats will get soaked. Rich says, I could duct tape the outside of the doors and climb back in through a window. So he seals us up and into the deep we go. I pray to the travel gods that this isn't a terrible mistake. We emerge on the other side, dry as toast. The brakes still work, the crowd claps and cheers. We could sell a case of duct tape, but we don't have any more. Let's leave the tape on, says Jean, just in case. We make it to our first campsite without having to ford another body of water and make spectacles of ourselves climbing out the windows. We aren't bothered. Our family faced a challenge together and we are stronger for it, just as the inadequate food provisions earlier gave us an opportunity to provide for ourselves. When there are problems at home, we aren't always on the same team. There are kids versus adults, males against females, and every man for himself. Everyone has escape routes, an office, a friend's house, the forest. Those options don't exist on the road. A family driving trip doesn't just force us to be together, it helps us to be together. When the opportunity finally comes for me to go all the way to Cabo San Lucas, I hesitate. It has become a true tourist mecca with the familiar fast food outlets, hotels for all budgets, many golf courses, nightclubs, and condominiums. Everything I hope to avoid by rushing down the road before the asphalt cooled has happened at the end of the road. Even Terry, who extends the invitation, to stay at her family condo declares Cabo ruined. 
my eyes narrow. And I would want to go there because it's a very nice condo and it's free, she says. It's a mother-daughter trip and it's free. All the mothers are your good friends and it's free, she repeats. So I go. It isn't free. There is airfare, car rental, meals out, pina coladas on the beach, Pacificos at the swim-up bar. It all adds up, but it's worth every peso. Not just for the time with my daughter and all the other women. It's weather and water warm enough to make a bedtime dip a sensuous pleasure. It's tuna so fresh, it still shimmers yellow until it becomes part of a fish taco. We don't have this at home. This isn't home. Even the familiar feels fresh in new surroundings. Vaughn and I play cribbage at the Hotel Cabo San Lucas Beach Bar. Vaughn, other commercial established, there are no other commercial establishments in sight. We face the ocean. Even in Cabo, the horizon is endless when you look out to the sea. I tell Terry that Cabo isn't ruined. It's just changed. I've changed too. I've traveled a zillion miles of unpaved road, been in the wild, remote places, but I've discovered I left some big cities and some resorts. I'm a bit wanton in my desires, as those in the throes of lust are wont to be. That lonely woman with too much time on her hands also had an undiagnosed case of wanderlust. That busy woman with friends and family near at hand still has one. A map, a road, an unseen beach. I turn my back on a place I love to wander the world, but I return to the end of the road, less paved, where the dream of Cabo first began. <laughs> Yay, yay, yay. Thank you, Fawn and, oh. and Mary. That was a, a wonderful uh, uh, taste, an appetizer of what the book is about. It is uh, your wonderful ability, Mary, to capture. You're just your wonderful dry, dry <laughs> wit. Um, I, I've enjoyed the book immensely. And, um, and I know all of you will as well. Um, so now I would like to bring Barbara in to um, have a chat with Mary and, uh, and uh, we'll see where go with that. Hi, Mary, should I start now, Suze? You hear me? Mary, you there? I'm here. Oh, good. Well, I, I'm here and I hear you. So good. I, I, I the same. I enjoyed that very much. I love the family aspect of the road less paved. I'm going to read a quote a little later because it's just so special, as is the book. And something that I appreciated enormously as one who, someone who writes also, is that you keep it so lively. And your tone is so immediate. I felt as I was reading it that you could be speaking to me or you could be writing me a letter. And it felt as though I was were just there. So to begin, I think I'll ask you to talk a little bit about the process of your writing for The Road Less Pay. Did you keep a journal while you traveled? Did you write letters home that you then looked at afterward? Um, did you, how soon did you work what must have been notes and, and on your travel into something that was like a story? So that's sort of the first question I think that people who like to read travel writing may wanna know. Tell us a little bit about the process of how you made this, these stories into a book. 
Well, there were a number of different ways that it happened. In the beginning, I, well, you ask about, like, did I keep a journal? No, no journal, nothing so formal. A little tiny spiral notebook with uh, particular things that I thought might be interesting because I was already interested in writing. Or I probably was writing, but at any rate, you know, I would write down things like um, the name of the hotel, where we stayed, maybe the room number, if there was anything special about it, uh, places we ate, what we ate, how much it cost, cost of gasoline. Uh, once in a blue moon, I would have some kind of inspirational, um, descriptive phrase, and I would write it down quick before I lost it because I don't feel like description is necessarily my strong point. But, you know, sometimes you just see it or you just hear it. Uh, so I found most of that stuff was pretty boring later, and I didn't use a lot of it. But I did use some of it, and it was helpful to have it. And uh, I have so many of those little tiny books from over the years, it's really hard to figure out how to file something like that. But that's one thing that happened. And then another thing that happened uh, that was a part of, you know, putting it together was um, like, what do, what is needed? Like, uh, sometimes you read or you hear about uh, a publication that is requesting submissions. And so it's what do they want? You know, that maybe you write something for them that you hope is what they want. And sometimes it is what they want. Uh, but I also had my own idea of what I wanted to do. And I did want to write for uh, the memory for my family, I suppose. But it wasn't all that unselfish. Some of it was just um, that I liked to travel. I was just caught up in it. And so I liked to read about travel. I liked to write it. And um, then I wanted to do some more of it. And so I don't know if any of that would be helpful to anyone who's trying to write. But I think it is good to keep the little notes. And um, OK, what next? And letters? Did you write letters home that you then could consult? Oh, yes. I did write letters. Remember letters, you guys? Not emails. These would be letters where you could actually make a copy of the letter uh, and keep it for yourself or send it to someone else. And I realized we can do all those things with email. But when you're writing a letter, it's like writing. It's more like writing, I think, than, than emails and certainly more than messages and, and things. And so these people were interested in what I was doing because they were my friends and family. And so they really wanted to know some details and they wanted to know how, how things affected me, if they touched me, if they were fun or if they were traumatic or whatever they were, uh, I yes, I'm glad you reminded me of the letter thing because I actually feel like it was huge. And um, some of those letters really became these stories where I uh, enlarged the letter, but sometimes I had to cut it back. <laughs> so yeah, letters were very, very important. I don't know that I can bring back letters, but I feel like they were important. Well, I think that's a very good cue to all of us who are traveling to send those letters. Maybe it's now by email or, and also when we're looking back, not to throw things away so that we might have them later encourage our kids and grandkids to write us letters, email, and we'll keep them for them. On the same note, 
I wondered, and it might be a question others might have, how do you plan for a long trip? The trip that's really featured in the main part of the book is your two months or maybe more than two months that you drive around South America. Fascinating, adventurous, colorful, but you have planned everything. What do you do to plan for such a long trip for yourself? And uh, this time it was just with Gino so and friend Mike. Tell us a yes. little about your prep. Well, number one, this is not a new question because people used to ask me, you know, how can you pack for two months? You can't. You have to just accept that you're going to take a very minimal amount of uh, clothing and stuff, and you're just going to use it over and over again. And that's the way it will be, whether that's the way your normal life is or not. That's the way it'll be when you're traveling. We had, like with South America, we knew at the end of the trip, we would have some cold weather. And we didn't pack for that. We planned for that, which was that we would buy uh, heavy duty things when we were down in that area where they have cold weather. Uh, it's not just us that will have cold weather. And so, they have these huge, heavy, wonderful uh, wool sweaters that are kind of like things that we all think would just go to the snow country. But uh, anyway, we bought those things there. And by then, we had all sent home things like snorkeling gear and bathing suits. So we divested of some and added on with others. And as far as other things were involved, I was a little bit controlling because I was the person sort of in charge of the planning. The mom. And I would say things to Mike like, what music are you bringing? I knew he would have to bring music because he's a music person. And um, so, you know, I wouldn't bring the same music. We wouldn't bring the same music. We would have a little nice variety of music um, and some way to play it. Uh, which we did have. Uh, oh, who's taking their Swiss Army knife? I mean, how many Swiss Army knives do you need? Um, a few things like that where we kind of parceled out what we would have among us. Uh, but mostly it was just like you're traveling light and uh, you're going to make it work. So. Well, that sounds good. Did you bring, did you think of bringing things, you know, like meds of any kind? Did you bring Pepto-Bismol? Did you bring, you were going to be traveling? Did you, you know, that sort of stuff. Now when I travel, it seems like my little pharmacy bag is bigger than anything else that I'm traveling with. Well, we were all younger then. I know. <laughs> and so we had less that we needed to take. And among the things we took, of course, there were things for various intestinal problems. Right. And, and we had a few of those, but not anything too bad. Uh, but it was easier to have it with you than to try and shop for it. And luckily, we didn't really have to try and shop for any unexpected medications. Um, and so that was good. Yeah. Well, that's a, tell me, I want, I want to just read this one passage, a couple of, just a couple of sentences about family travel. This is Mary's writing. I prefer the camaraderie and the closeness of family travel. There's a synergy in sharing that gives a legendary quality to shared memories. Family travel provides an opportunity for parents and children, relatives and friends, to be together on the magic side of time. So tell me, um, what would you, if, if someone's going to just dive into this book, maybe they're going to look for one chapter, one place they're most interested in. Tell us about one place, one adventure that in some way is most memorable. Okay, 
<clears throat> Machu Picchu, I'm sorry not to be more original, but we expected it would be a highlight and it was a highlight. And so we were super happy that we had um, splurged on uh, renting a room at the hotel that's right there on site so that we could wake up there one morning so that we could go to sleep there one night so we could have some time without um, the moblitude and uh, just, uh, you know, that was great to be able to do that. We were not disappointed uh, in that. And there were so many other wonderful places and so many other wonderful experiences. But I, w I think that was the highlight of the trip. If you have to just pick one place, that was it. Um, you know, in writing, as far as writing about this stuff, my favorite chapter in the book that I wrote that was the most fun was writing the chapter Mike's Cane. So any of you who read the book, maybe you'll um, see how that could be so much fun and how weird it is that a book called Family Travel would choose a story that included a lot of penises. I mean, we went to a museum and we so did not realize or expect that it was, um, I mean, it, it was folk, folk art. And it makes kind of sense that in folk art, they were sort of starting to maybe realize maybe how babies were made, I don't know. But there were a lot of very exaggerated sculptures and uh, it was fun to um, be able to write about that without maybe being uh, bad, not being a bad girl, just trying to keep it somewhat in the realm of something that's okay for almost anyone and everyone to read. Uh, but really the last thing in the world I would have ever expected is that it would be chosen for a book on family travel. But now, you know, with time, time's gone by, I realize part of it was probably like no one else sent anything like that in. <laughs> the editor was probably like, wow, so this really helps with how to Person. Well, that's then, and then I think it was a female. Um, I know it was a female. She would call me and say, "What if we say this? What if we say that?" So we had a little bit of fun, sort of doing some rewriting. And who knows if everything in there happened and was said exactly the way it was. It, it, it's true to the um, spirit of how it happened. So, thank you. There we go. I that sort of leads into the next and final question because we want people who are attending near and far to ask Mary questions. Um, you really create characters, real life characters. Mike, your travel companion, who's somewhat, somewhat crippled, but who manages to climb the heights of Machu Picchu with you using his sticks. And Gino, who's a wonderful character, now he's all grown up, but he was a little boy, he was a nine-year-old, uncomplaining for the most part, at least in the book, and then you and Jean. And so I sort of wonder what, you're writing nonfiction, but I know you write fiction as well. How is it different? How close do you stay to what really happened? How do you decide what to throw out leave out and um how much do you want this to be kind of a record a true record of your life and travel in a way leave you with that tougher question 
So what is that last part? How much do I want this to be? What? Be a kind Say it of, again. You know, it's, it's not exactly a memoir, but it, it's, uh, it's kind of your true life. As no, a, it's, to it's totally memoir. You know, it's like yeah, nobody's interested in your writing. Nobody's publishing anything within them. It's like, who are you writing for? Well, hello. I can write for my family. I can write for myself. I can put this stuff down. And really, that's when I did come up with people who wanted to publish. You and Florian Press were one of the first, and it was a, the Machu Picchu thing. And it was a huge thrill for me. And then I, uh, and, and I think you are the person who suggested I should be submitting to Traveler's Tales from O'Reilly because they were doing a lot of travel books. It's like they had come into existence, especially for me. So I started sending things to them and, and I got quite a few things published with them, including that one I mentioned, Mike's Cane. Uh, I sent them something for a book they called Love and Romance, and uh, I didn't get in, but my friend Maureen Jennings did, and so when I look at that on the shelf, I always feel like I'm in there, because my friend is in there, but I, I wasn't really in there, or maybe that was Italy, that was Italy, that was I Italy. submitted that to Italy, Maureen, is the one who got in. But then I still had that story, so I sent it when they came out with the love and romance well, thing. It was like, you know. Well, I have fun. to just thank, you know, thank you and highly recommend to our friends and to those who become will become friends and with Mary through this book because it's so lively. I, I know I've read a lot of travel writing. Sometimes it doesn't feel that you know the person very well. You know a lot about what they've seen, but Mary keeps it so active and so much fun, and I hope you will all read it. Maybe we'll open, Suze, you'll open the discussion to people asking questions yeah. to Mary. Yeah, um, we, uh, we can open it up now to, um, to either uh, participants uh, raising their hand uh, through the participants box. Um, I think Tina will see that and can call on you. You'll be unmuted and can ask your question, or you could go to the chat room and write your question, and we can look at the question from there and read it to Mary. Tina, are you there? Here. Yeah. <laughs> no hands up yet. Everybody's thinking of questions. No hands up. Okay. Does everyone see how to raise your hand? If you go to the bottom of the screen, it says uh, there's a little uh, walk square that says participants. You check, you click on that icon right above the word participants. And then if you go to the bottom right, when that comes up, there'll be a little icon that says raise hand. So we that's have Kenzie with the first question. Ooh. Hi. Hi. Hi, Kenzie. <laughs> Hi, sweetheart. I have a question. I mean, obviously, and I think this book is an example of it, but being your granddaughter, I feel like I'm extra privileged to know that you've lived a life full of many travels and many, many stories. And so I'm curious how you chose which ones to put in this book and which ones you're saving for a later date or maybe another book or maybe just a, you know, good afternoon in a rocking chair. Hey, that's not a bad question at all. Thanks. Any question from you is a good question. Okay. I, I have a lot more stories and some of them are included in another book I'm working on. I call it a novel, but uh, anyone who knows me will read it and see that mostly it's not a novel. 
it's uh, still, you know, real stuff, real people, but their names may be changed. And there'll be more travel stuff in there, but it won't all be uh, traveling to places. Some of it will be traveling into yourself, uh, into your life, you know, that sort of thing. But what I, the way I chose for this is I had a geographical um, place. So even though the book doesn't include a map, and it probably should have a map, it moves from Occidental California down into um, Baja, California, which is Mexico, but you know, it hangs down there. Um, and then the regular continent of Mexico and down into Central America, South America, I had a geographic picture in my mind and I left out things like, oh, Papua New Guinea. Just didn't seem to fit in to me, even though I have some of that. Uh, so we'll see what else I come up with. But it's sure nice to see you. And thank you for all your help with whatever uh, background pictures we do or don't have. I'm going to be having a real pleasure uh, watching this later when it's on YouTube and uh, really appreciating your help. And I want to say hi to Delaney. I think I see her. Hi, Delaney. Hello. So great that you're here. Thank you so much. Love. Um, we have a question from Susan Bono. Oh, no, excuse me. Mary Lou is next. Hi. Hey. Um, well, first of all, I love the scene with the duct tape that just like when I was reading that in the book, it just made me howl because I thought yeah. okay, only the Gaffney family would just have confidence that this was going to work and they were going to make it to the other side. So I love the sense of adventure that the whole family has in the book and all the stories. And I also love the recipes. And I remember a long, long time ago, Mary gave to her friends a recipe book that was uh, Mexican, South American, and with a few pictures of the travels. And, um, and I noticed in this book, there were a few recipes here and there. And I thought that kind of was a, that it, I also liked that. There were some good cocktail recipes in there and other things. So it made it, it's just a very friendly and funny and very accessible. And for me, armchair chair traveler that I can be, I really enjoyed uh, the descriptions. And I wondered though, there's, there's that uh, tendency sometimes when you're in another country with its own culture to um, be a little dismissive of that culture. And I didn't see that happen often, although I know you were not happy with the cold water and the showers, which seems yeah. maybe that's, how did you, were you aware of that when you were writing or did you just go ahead and put it out as you saw it without thinking about the, uh, let's say political correctness of something or that? Yeah, I, 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 I didn't think too much about political correctness. I've been, um, I've been, you know, kind of uh, informed at various stages of don't use this word, don't use that word, don't even go there on certain things. Uh, I don't think I'm too politically incorrect, but you know, nowadays it's, uh, it's tricky out there. What's okay, what's not okay. Um, I certainly didn't mean to be dismissive of anything, but you know, cold water showers, I'm sorry, I'm a princess. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, we next have um, a question from Susan Bono. What was your most hair-raising adventure? Ooh, Susan, leave it to Susan. Hi, oh, Susan. <laughs> hair-raising, oh my gosh, hair-raising. Oh my gosh, you should have sent me this question ahead of time. <laughs> Climbing Wanapichu. That was difficult for me 
Now in my life, my current life, I have COPD. I probably had it way back then. I mean, I've had trouble breathing for ages. And that was a steep, steep climb. But it was also, it was a country that does not have the kind of safety uh, features that we have here. And so there were many cliffhanger uh, kind of trails with, you know, there's nothing between you and falling off into the abyss. And here I am with a child and a guy who's pretty handicapped and another guy who's like, just confessed to me that he's taken LSD. It's like, and he doesn't feel like he's really totally with it. And it's like, everything about that was pretty scary. But we made it, and we, we did, we made it to the top. And somewhere among the pictures that you might see, you might see a picture of a woman in a red sweater, kind of sprawled out, totally exhausted on top of a big rock, and that's the top of Wanapichu. And, and in terms of what Wanapichu is, for those of you who wouldn't know, it's even higher than Machu Picchu, and it's something that you see in the background sometimes when you're looking at Machu Picchu pictures. It's in the background. It's, it's real, uh, kind of like an ice cream cone that's been looked pretty well around the edges. That's the shape of it. Um, that was pretty hairy. But I'm proud I did it. I'm glad we all did it. Everyone is. So. Thank you, Mary. Next question is from uh, Delia Swan. Hi. Did I properly unmute? Delia, hello. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You're good. Delia, um, she's still muted. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You, okay. There you go. Good yeah. time. My question. I read Anne Lamott. I read Stephen King. I have a whole bunch of books up there on how the hell to write. And I love writing and I think I have a voice and I write letters all the time, old fashioned letters. Um, but I would love to know um, your advice, Mary. How do you begin to actually write? I've got timelines that span this whole room. I have ideas and I write. Get, get yourself involved with some other writers. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. That is uh, my very, very first piece of advice because they will uh, help you. You will help them. When you help them, you help yourself. I think um, they also become a fabulous support group. So they understand, you know, <coughs> pardon me, they understand um, well, what you go through, if you're submitting and being rejected, oh, hello, that's going to happen. <laughs> so that's my first piece of advice. All right. And I suppose, I suppose uh, living here, that's probably not that difficult to do. I probably just need to put it out there. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, I could probably. Oh. I could probably help you. Check this out. You've got it. And I, got, I made you some bath salts. I'll bring them by tomorrow. <laughs> oh, thank you. thank you so much, Delia. Um, yeah, we have some great writing groups in the in in this neck of the woods. Um, I could recommend one right now. Is in our audience. <laughs> um, I uh, want to go now to Andrea Granahan with a question. I, w I was just wondering why <laughs> climbing uh, that mountain, <laughs> what you thought was most harrowing, when you wrote about this incredibly romantic scene with you and your husband on this beach, 
all by yourself, and then you almost drowned. <laughs> what, what, you know, wasn't that a terribly frightening experience? And you almost didn't make it. That was, am I, am I speaking to you? That was actually more frightening. But in the moment of the question, this other frightening part came up. But yes, there is actually nothing more frightening than feeling that you are perhaps going to die. But, you know, that could happen on the hike, too. So it's like, woo, hello. Yeah. And as far as I want to go back to the writing group, although this may sound like, you know, famous promotion is not the same as shameless self-promotion, Susan Bono often has writing groups. So Delia, Susan, yeah, possible, possible hookup. Just want to say that. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I second that. Um, we have now Anita White. Um, Mike Stenger wants to know, most harrowing wasn't drifting to Honduras. No. Hello? I'm my on. Yeah. Drifting to Honduras. No, it was not the most harrowing. Okay. I kind of felt that we would be okay. I I really did feel that was not going to be the worst thing that could ever happen to us. What if we did drift all the way to Honduras? Mm -hmm. Okay. We're in Honduras. You know, it's like it's not the same as dying. It's just uh, a, a, definitely a glitch in your plans. But, but that's how you, how you always seem to roll with it, is you just stayed in the moment and rolled with it. And that's what I love about the book, is how you, how you navigated these unexpected um, situations. <laughs> we have um, another question. Tell us a bit from Pat. Uh, tell us a bit about Tierra del Fuego. Well, we didn't spend a whole lot of time there. It was super cold and windy and inhospitable, as you kind of know in advance, it probably will be. But we were there. So we took a ferry boat across to be there and then we took a ferry boat to get back to the mainland so it's like a an island well it isn't like an island it is an island um, so when we were there we went to the beach and uh we thought maybe we would for instance feed some seagulls nope there's no seagulls it's like most um, of the kind of life that you think you might see uh, at the beach isn't there. So we all had that as the, we all being Jean and Mike and I, and Gino maybe didn't care, uh, but he did love the idea that he was going to the end of the earth. And, and we did, so, you know, we were all committed that we had to go to the end of the earth, but uh, we didn't really end up making it much of a, a destination where we spent a lot of time mm -hmm. because yeah. it wasn't pleasant. And, yeah. and we had found a place we really liked <laughs> back on the mainland. It was sort of like, yes, let's go back and we can go to this restaurant. We had super good food and uh, we had, Maybe we had sort of come to the end of the road. We hadn't really because we were going to backtrack and do some special places, but it sort of had lost a little of its allure. I'm sorry if I'm disappointing with my lack of great information, but that's the way it was, Pat. But you did it, and that was had been your your destination to go to the end of of the line and you did it. Yes. 
and it, it's very remote and um but you did it so that mission accomplished and then you could go back to your more favorite places and that segues right into the next question out of all the wonderful places in the book where would you most like to return to and why hmm. Well, even though Machu Picchu was my favorite place that I, but I'm not sure that, well, I couldn't return there. So hello, any of you with breathing issues, go ahead, go to Machu Picchu because, you know, the altitude is huge. Uh, Cusco, which is your, um, also a really great site to go to as far as they have some really interesting um, archaeological ruins and everything. They're even higher, uh, greater altitude than Machu Picchu. So all those high altitudes, they're really hard if you have respiratory trouble. So I'm not longing to go back there. You know, I've got enough trouble. I'm not going there. Um, but of what is actually there that I could go to, I haven't thought about it because I think as happens to so many people with wanderlust, uh, you maybe start thinking about the new place, the place you haven't been. Greece would be nice. You know, yeah, like, like, yeah that sort of thing. Yeah, the, the, the road not taken yet. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's true of all with Wanderlust, as I have as well. But Mary, I think we've come, um, I'm trying to see if there are any other questions. I think, I think we've come to the end of our, our wonderful discussion and event. And I just thank you all for coming and Mary and Gino and Fawn and Barbara and Tina for making this all happen. Um, we are so thrilled you came and um, please buy the book. Uh, that's the first thing you can go to the website or you, I think you will receive from Tina uh, a link to all those who came who registered will get a link on how to purchase the book. And then you, there'll also be a uh, YouTube um, uh, recording of this whole evening for you to come back and listen to or to uh, send on to, to friends who couldn't make it tonight. So we're really pleased that you all were here and, uh, and we carry on. We carry on um, with great courage and levity and please come to our concert, next virtual concert, November 7th, um, that Tina is cooking up. And then our next virtual book launch will be November 15th with Joan Frank. So thank you all. And I, I think we say a good night. Yay. <laughs> <laughs>